This is surreal. This is very much surreal. I'm going to be kind of emotional this morning, uh, but first, without further ado, I do want to go ahead and say thanks to a few different people, a few different reasons. But uh, first and foremost, I want to just say thank you to the church. You all make up the church. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it this morning, but you have something special here. Very special. It's not these walls. It's you. You guys have loved me and my family while we've been gone for over a year. Kept in touch. So much as to fly my wife out and fly me out. We don't deserve it. But your love is just amazing. You have something special. So the church, I thank everybody that ended up flying my wife out, flying me out. We both needed it. And I'll explain why. So thank you for everybody that had a hand in that. The media ministry, the Facebook, that is an amazing ministry. You have no idea how many people, number one, that reaches with the truth of the gospel. And then how many people that touches 1,500 miles away in South Dakota. So for the many hands that were put into the Facebook media ministry, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the many prayers you give for me and my family. The thoughts. Checking on us. None of it would be possible without God. So I give thanks to God for the love that he's put into you to show us. Few of you uh, are brand new to me. Haven't seen some of y'all, seen some Facebook pictures and everything. So I just want to give a little bit about me and my family and how do we fit here at Open Door? Just real quick. So the military moved us from Maxwell, Alabama, Montgomery, back around the year 2008. We were here at a revival service, and Dave Young was having a revival message. I was sitting about right here. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. I came right up here. Got saved. Wouldn't have happened without the church, the people. Obviously, without God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. February 2009, I got saved right here. Since then, the Lord's been doing a work in our lives through you all. And so, a little bit about, we've been here since 2008. Military uh, saw fit to go ahead and move us to South Dakota back in September of last year. So we've been in South Dakota for a little more than a year now. Completely different culture. How many people have lived up north? Like lived, not visited. Okay. Could I get an amen? Culture is a lot different, is it not? It is totally different. Took us a while to realize that. So we moved up there. We've been there about a year and a half. But thanks to the media ministry, we're able to follow the church, the messages. The truth that's preached from this pulpit, no matter if it's Pastor Ken, Brother Mike Jones, whoever's filling this pulpit, we don't really hear that much up there. And so I'm not going to talk much about that, but you have something special. So again, that's a little bit about me. Some, something else that the Lord allowed us to do through this, through this church was have our Contending for Christ apologetics ministry. Now, pastors going through the Amazing series, I believe is what it's called. And I love that. That is really my forte. And I had planned on talking a message about apologetics to tie into that. But pastor wanted me to give an update as far as us and what's going on. So I'm going to tie our update into a song. We're going to sort of put the two together. But Contending for Christ C4C Apologetics is born out of really this church. And it's born out of Jude verse 3, where Jude says to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares. And so it's more about defending the faith, defending the truthfulness of God, confronting heresy, and then exposing cults, atheism, things like that. So I'd encourage you, uh, if you need a little more information about apologetics, is faith reasonable? If you've ever dealt with an atheist, I'll say faith in God is irrational and unreasonable. There's no reason to believe in God. But when you look at it, 
there's more reasons to believe in God than there is in not in God. Dr. Frank Turk says, I don't have the faith to be an atheist. They have to exhibit a lot more faith. So what this ministry does is two things, pre-evangelism and post-evangelism. Pre-evangelism try to go ahead and show an atheist or a skeptic their need for a God. Post-evangelism to sort of solidify our faith. Because when we go through what I'm about to talk, to, talk about this morning, we got to trust that God is who he is, his character is who it, who it says he is, that the Bible is true. So that's part of the post-evangelistic front of apologetics. So I'd encourage you, again, that's part of this church's ministry. But I want to go ahead and mention a uh, sermon called, Where is God in our loneliness? How many people throughout the course of your Christian faith have been lonely? I'm just curious. That's it. That's it. Huh? I believe that... Uh, most all of us at one point in time, if we could really track this down in a period of our life, we were lonely in some way, shape, or form. And that's what me and my wife have been going through for over a year. We're going to find our text in Psalm 142. So if you want to turn there, a little bit of background of Psalm 142. It's believed that David is writing this psalm while he's in a cave. He's hiding from Saul. And basically, if, if you sort of track the history, the story of David... David was anointed as a king, 1 Samuel chapter 16, I believe it was. Then in chapter 17, he defeats Goliath. 40 days, Goliath is taunting the Israelite army. No one is man enough to stand until David comes. A little shepherd boy, probably around 15 years old. He defeats Goliath. After that, he's a mighty man of war. And the saying goes that King Saul killed thousands, and David killed tens of thousands. Because of that, Saul gets jealous. Saul starts trying to kill David. So David's fling, he's in this cave, is what many believe in Psalm 142. So I want to read this psalm real quick, tie a little bit of our update into this psalm, and I encourage you, if you go through bouts of loneliness, and you're questioning, where is God in my loneliness? I encourage you just to reflect upon this, reflect upon this psalm, Whatever the Spirit may be talking to you today. But before, I'd like to go ahead and open with a word of prayer. And we move forward. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly God, I thank you first and foremost, Lord, just to have the privilege to be here to proclaim your word. God, I thank you for the love of this community that they have shown to me and my family. God, they have no idea what it's meant to us in our days. God, pray that they would just receive a blessing of their faithfulness, their love, their generosity. We know that it's only because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross that we can show love. We know that God is love. So, Lord, thank you. God, I pray that you would just remove me of myself and just allow the Spirit to reach, teach, and convict, and do all the work that the Spirit would need to do. God, I know there's many things on our hearts and our minds today, and we all carry certain burdens and weights. Lord, allow us to just cast them aside for a moment, to focus on your word. God, I thank you for our experiences that we go through, because though it may be tough in the midst of them, we know there's a purpose and a reason and that you work in us to work through us. So God, I pray that you would just take this time, you deliver your word to the intended recipients. I do pray for Pastor Ken and everything going on. Pray that you would just bless this service. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to read through Psalm 142 real quick. Scripture says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I walked, have they privily laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. 
Bring my soul out of prison that I might praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. I'm going to get emotional. Those of you that remember me, I was never emotional until I got saved. And then the Spirit just sort of breaks me and everything. So I probably will get choked up a little bit. But I want to focus on things. There's five steps, I believe, I can take this psalm and look at my life and my family's life through this past year. There's five different aspects that I'm drawing out of this. The first thing I want to really look at are the first five verses. The first five verses. David said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed. When it was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. I want to talk a little bit about that as far as Remember, David at this time is believed that he's being chased. He's hiding in a cave. David was the anointed king. Samuel came at an earlier time in his life and said, you're going to be the successor. Now David's going through this. David, at this point in time, doesn't have the friends around him. He's chased out of the area, trying to find some sort of refuge somewhere. He's alone. Possibly scared. Lonely and angry. When we moved to South Dakota, we visited, I'm not going to name the names, we visited seven churches trying to find our place. We visited all seven churches and we could not find the formula that Open Door had. We looked at numerous different church styles. We went to an evangelical free church. We visited a a chapel, you know, like the whole Calvary Chapel uh, churches out there. We visited an independent fundamental Baptist church. We visited a First Baptist church. You know, we visited a few different churches. And I hate to say it, but there's a lot of folks that are good door greeters. Good door greeters. And we need door greeters. Don't, don't get me wrong. We need that first impression at the church, the smile, the welcoming, the, oh, I'm so glad you're here this morning. But that's where it stopped. We've been gone for over a year. We've tried plugging in. We went to like two or three churches for multiple months at a time. We had nothing. Okay? Like David's alone in this cave at this period in his life, me and my family were on an island. Now, part of that problem was, and I'll talk a little bit about it here in a little bit, was we were trying to find open door. We were trying to find you. And we couldn't do it, right? We'll get into that in a little bit. We had loneliness. We had depression. If you're a husband here today, if you're a father, there is probably no greater pain in your life, than to watch your wife or your child I told you <laughs> to watch them cry every other week. I'm alone. I don't have anybody. Granted, it's me, my wife, and my kids. We loved each other. We obviously connect. Nuclear family, the whole deal. But to watch your wife cry regularly. I'm so alone. Rip out my heart. I did everything to try to help her. Those of you who know my wife, Rebecca, she's very social. I'm more of the non-social butterfly type. If you put me in a room of 100 people, I could sit in the corner. I'm good, just people watching. My wife does like the acquaintances and meeting folks. And so it took a toll on me in a different sense, but on my wife, she was being attacked by herself, by Satan. We tried everything we could do. We tried making connections. 
I sent a message out saying, hey, we've been to this area for a couple months. Hey, I'd love to go ahead and meet together once a month to get to know you guys. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about Bible, get some coffee. Zero replies. None. My wife tried the same thing too. Nothing. We're so alone. We're in our cave. Our refuge is gone. Acts 2.42, that first century church. Together you continued in the word daily, breaking bread, fellowshipping. That's what y'all got here. We were looking for our open door Baptist church and we could not find it. We tapped out of every church out there. So that's really the first part. When, when David's here, he's crying to the Lord. It's making his supplication. That's the first part. We were alone. But praise God, it doesn't end there. When we're in, when we're in our series of loneliness, it doesn't stop there unless you want it to stop there. You've got to put your head down and keep going. I tell people in the military, what makes a good leader is not about whether you make a good or a bad decision, whether you succeed or fail. What makes a good leader is if you fail, you pick your head up, you figure out what went wrong, and you just keep moving forward. That's what makes a good leader. It doesn't matter if you're in the military, civilian, or in church. That's what makes a good leader. You have got to keep going forward because Satan will keep you on the ground, and keep kicking you while you're down. But it took us a while. You see, the second thing was questions. Again, David was anointed as the next king. David was used to defeat Goliath. All the Israelites were scared of this guy. David said, this uncircumcised Philistine is defying the living God and you're doing nothing. I'm going to go out there with a sling. He says, you come with me, a sword and spear. I come, in to you, come to you in the name of the Lord. David stood up. David got chased away. I'm sure David's wondering, why? He's got questions. In our loneliness, I imagine we have questions too. Why are we here? Did I do something wrong? Did I make a bad decision? David says he's pouring out his complaint. There is nothing wrong with pouring our complaint to God. Does God know everything? Is God omniscient? Does God know what's in our heart? If we have that complaint in our heart, God already knows it. It's good on us to be able to get it off our chest. I'm in the military. When I give feedback to my airmen, to my troops and everything, I tell them I'm a, what's called a ventilation shaft. They come in and they're really stressed. They need to get something off their chest. I say, okay, I want to be your ventilation shaft. I want you to be able to vent and then just get it out there, right? So do me a favor, just say, hey, you know, put all rank aside, you know, can I just vent? Definitely. Everybody needs to be able to vent. I encourage you, if you don't have somebody to vent about, find somebody you can trust that won't gossip about whatever you're venting, because we all need to unload that. You see, our time was coming up. We were in Air Force ROTC at Alabama State. We were there about five and a half years, and we knew we had to leave. We couldn't stay there much longer. We had one of two choices, and those of you that are in the military, you sort of really know, I can either A, put in for an assignment, or B, most likely, have the military choose for me. We've been here almost 10 years. I saw God get me to Alabama State. I saw God keep us here. At the time, I was like, it, we've grown, we got saved, we learned a lot. I think it's time we have to spread our wings and fly. So we put in for orders. We put in for Air Force, said, hey, Air Force, I want you to send me to one of these six bases. They gave us the number two choice. We got sent to Ellsworth Air Force Base, South Dakota. We we're in the second largest state, uh, second largest city in the state of Rapid City, about 70,000 people. If you were to take Prattville and Millbrook and put them together, that's about the size of Rapid City. So we put in for the orders and everything. We got there. We went to seven churches. We can't make a friend. I'm okay with it a little bit. My wife, not so much. Again, crying almost every week. I can't do nothing. I'm, hand I'm handcuffed. So now I start asking, why are we here? 
Did I do this because I thought this was the right decision? Did I make a wrong decision? Am I doing something wrong or bad? I started doing some self-reflection, looking back, questioning myself, questioning the decisions, playing over my head the different thought processes I had through this assignment. We're angry. Wife gave me liberty to say whatever came out of my mind, but I write a letter. You know her, Becca. You know her heart. I'm just sitting on the couch here. Bob was there, so I'm like, hmm. Looks like there's little pieces of paper in there. I'm curious. You know, the different notes she's taking and everything. She's got a note there. I'm angry at God. Wow. We make the right decision. A good leader picks her head up and keeps going. Good leader will not stay down and let Satan just keep kicking him. At the time, we were so caught up in not having a church, not having friends, questioning our decisions. God knows what's in our heart. It's okay to vent to God. As long as it doesn't allow us to stay there. Okay, so we had questions. Is this right? Were we supposed to do this? And second step. Third step. David says, Oh, where is it at? He says, I'm turned to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. Again, you know the background of David and why he's writing this and everything. He's being persecuted. He was alone. Persecution for us came from two different fronts. Persecution came from us, our, ourselves, putting it on ourselves. We forgot God has a purpose and a plan through all this. So we're putting a lot of this stress on ourselves, questioning whether we followed the will of God or not. But then the other part of that persecution comes from Satan. John 10.10, 10, Jesus says that the thief comes in but to kill, destroy, and to steal. Satan wants to kill your confidence. He wants to destroy your testimony. And he wants to steal your joy. He did that to me and my wife, and we let him. You can't have your joy taken away. You can give your joy away. We said, here you go. Because we took our eyes off of God. I'll be perfectly honest with you. We took our eyes off God. We did everything. My wife's crying, and she, I don't know what to do. We've prayed constantly. We've fasted. We really didn't even watch TV, but had Christian music on 24-7. We did everything we knew. Devotion after devotion. I got this book, Disciplines of a Godly Man. This has been very influential in my life. Dog ears, tab, notes, and everything. We did everything to fix what our problem was. The problem was, is we were trying to find a magic formula to get us back to where we wanted to be. We were trying to do and do and do. It's all good to pray, to fast, to do your devotions, to listen to Christian music all the time. Those are wonderful things. But if you're just trying to do this just to fix a problem, rather than trying to do this to fix your relationship and fellowship with God, is vanity. I didn't realize this until my wife told me this. All those things, we were just trying to do it to fix our situation at that time. Satan had us down so low that we forgot that our communion with God was separated. It wasn't that he left, it's that we left. We left. And so we tried to find the formula for success. We were in our emotional prison. You know, then David says here in the second half of verse 5, he said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. He says at the end of 7, 
He says, the righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. In our life, like I said, we, we had to reshift our focus. First, we were emotionally distraught. We were lonely. We were alone. We couldn't find nobody. We're asking questions. Why? <sighs> then we had to look at the persecution with ourselves and say, what are we doing? What's happening to us? Here we had to reshift our focus. And Rebecca really got this a lot sooner than I did because women typically do that a lot sooner than guys do. For about eight months, seven months, we were looking for you all. We were looking for Joe, DT, Tommy, Jim, you know, Ben, Holly, just everybody here. We are going to a church. We were like, where's our Brock? You know, where's Melody? You know, and we found a Brock. It took a little bit of time, but we found you, Brock, out there. But we kept comparing every church we visited to you. Was that wrong? That was totally wrong. Because every church's makeup is different. Every church has its own personality, its own vision, its own bent. We looked for Pastor Ken. You guys have something very special in Pastor Ken. This man's boldness, his passion, his fervency in study, scripture, the Jewish insight, you have something. We found that while we were here, we got complacent. Our comfort started leaning towards you all. We found our being in you all. Once you take us out of your body, we kept trying to find you again. And we couldn't do it. It took a while for us to realize there's not open door out there. There's a First Baptist Church out there. God revealed that to us that God has to be, Jesus has to be our only portion. Pastor said before, I don't, I don't know if I really agreed with him, but I do now. But God won't use a man greatly until he's broken greatly. We were shattered. During this time, God allowed us, with the wisdom of my wife, to reshift our focus. We've got to put our eyes on our contentment. With If we had no one in the world, would we be content with Jesus? It took our loneliness to come to that spot. Think about it. Jesus knows everything we went through. If there's anybody that knew anything about loneliness and rejection, it's the Messiah. He came to save a world he created. He died in place of the world. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. The world rejected him. He was spat on, smacked beaten, scourged. His apostles outside of John and a couple of the women deserted him at the cross. And he did that for all of us. If there's anybody that knew loneliness, I would succumb to it, believe it would be Jesus. We had to realize that our contentment came only in the relationship with Christ. We had a great camp out on Friday night. It was one of the best camp outs we've ever had here at Open Door. I, I would believe so. I think Matt would attest to that as well. But about 15 people there. We were up till, what, 3.30 in the morning talking about different things. It was crazy discussions and everything. I, I do know that Scripture does declare that the, the earth is round and spherical and everything. That's a discussion for another day and time. But... It was amazing. We were up till 3.30 until we were like, we got to get a little bit of sleep. So they went in their hammocks and their tents, and I got a little soft moving up north, so I climbed in the back of Matt's truck and slept on the, the bench seat and everything, nice and warm and, and whatnot. At that camping trip, Josiah said something that really uh, struck me. We had a wonderful devotion and everything about depression, press or depressed, and thank you, Brother Matt, for doing that. But Josiah brought up an idea of Paul. He said, Philippians, you know, Paul goes through everything. He learned how to be in, in great, you know, blessings and great need. He says, in every state I have learned, therefore, to be content. Contentment, right? And I just focused on one key word. Learned. How do you learn something? 
by doing, by experiencing, by trying, by situations, right? You don't really learn math without doing math. You learn how to speak without trying to speak. Contentment, you have to learn contentment. One way to learn contentment is by having the blessing of a church family like this and being alone. We had blessing and we had need. Until we saw that aspect of it, deep down we probably wouldn't understand what it meant to be content with Jesus. God put us through this to reshift our focus to allow us to be content in only having Messiah with us that whole time. So we had to reshift our focus. It was amazing because after that, so we went through the emotional pain, the loneliness, we went through the questioning God, we went through the persecution, we went through reshifting our focus. And it takes me to the final aspect of it, is trust. Here in the Psalm 142, David says, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. He says, Thou shalt deal bountifully with me. Going through this sort of process, we learn trust again. I'm fascinated that you guys are going through this apologetic series. But if God is who God says He is in this book right here, 66 love letters, with Yeshua identified in each book, all the different sayings and promises God tells us through Jesus. If He is who He says, He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do we really trust that? A lot of times our circumstances and our situations will take our eyes off of this, put our eyes on all this, right? And until we learn that contentment of Jesus, we couldn't really focus on the promises of this word because we were focused on our surroundings and our circumstances. But after all this, we, we started looking at the, the word of God and the trust aspect and everything. Do we trust God as personal? That is something different that the theistic worldview has over the atheistic worldview. Atheism, according to Bertrand Russell, says that life is just pitiless indifference. There is no purpose for us to be here. We live, we die. Our own purpose is whatever we make it. So if I find my fulfillment in doing this debauchery, hey, that, that's fine. You find yours over here. But we know that God is a personal God. That not only did He make us in His image, but He wants a personal relationship with us shown by the cross. See, personal. Then Scripture also declares that God does care for us. Peter says, cast all your cares on Him for He cares Cast all your cares on Him, for He cares for you. I've done that time or two, and I'm sure you have before. But Satan allowed that box of my care to be super glued into my hands. And I couldn't give it away. And the same thing with my wife. Until we reshifted our focus, and realized where our contentment was found in, we harbored that. We have to trust that God has a plan for us in our lives. Or He says to Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you and ordained you that you'd be a prophet among the nations. We know that that's not all of our calling, but with a theistic worldview and a reading scripture, God has a plan and a desire for every one of us here today. For it's God's will that all should be saved, come to repentance. Man, you, you grow and you, you fellowship and you commune with God. You, you be the branches off the vine of John 15. You abide and, and you start learning His will. You learn how do you want to use me, Lord? See, we had to trust that God does have a hand in our lives, but also a plan through all this. The pastor said, God doesn't use a man greatly until he breaks him greatly. And we've experienced that. And I'm glad to say it took about a year, but we didn't let Satan keep us down. We got our joy back. We started going to First Baptist Church, and that's where we're plugged in now. We pulled my kids out of like three different youth groups. You know, Alyssa, and she makes friends very easily. But we pulled her out of three youth groups, and when we finally committed, said, hey, we're going to be at First Baptist out there, they didn't believe me. So Alyssa was so reserved and closed off, I'm not making any friends because we're just going to leave again. I did that as a father, as a spiritual leader. And I felt bad about that, obviously. But thank God, 
When we reshifted our focus, we found our contentment in, in Christ. We start leaning on His words and His promises. We start reflecting on the process of everything. We see God's guiding hand through all this. And part of that was with the love and the things you all have done with us and for us. And so shortly after, we really committed to Open, or <laughs> open Door Baptist Church, but uh, we still talk about you guys. But once we started committing to First Baptist, I had talked to the pastor out there, the senior pastor. I was like, I just want to let you know if there's anything we can do, serve, you know, whatever the case is, we're here. It seemed like he was very hesitant about any of that. And I can understand a pastor and trying to get other people plugged in, especially if you're not a member, whatever the case is. But he ended up resigning at the church about, what was it? September, he tendered his resignation at the church. One of the things he said was he thinks it's time for him to step away because he feels that the Holy Spirit is wanting the church to go in a different direction. It's part of the American Baptist Association. And so he took a regional position up there. He was going through the story. Hey, they interviewed me. Didn't think I would take it. You know how the stories go. Oh, you know, I didn't get the job. But he did accept the job. So our youth pastor, Nate, great guy. He has a great heart. He's filling in right now and everything. Uh, so now we're able to see, okay, we've seen a lot. We've seen loneliness. We've seen a pastoral resignation. We've seen what happens to the church body when a pastor resigns. We're starting to see the pastoral search committee process. And uh, through all that, from that time period forward, the senior pastor, as he was about to have his last service there, he was like, hey, because Wednesday nights we do a David and Goliath study. We sort of facilitate it. Watch one of the uh, Louis Giglio, and then we talk about it, one of the book studies and everything. He was like, hey, w would you mind if you took this over and started you know, facilitating it and everything? Oh, I, I love doing that stuff. I love facilitating. Uh, I've learned a lot about facilitating. Can I get an amen to the people out there at the camp out there? I was facilitating very well out there, keeping communication going, and then stepping back. They called me troll. But uh, so once we figured all this out, we started trusting and leaning on God more. Now he's starting to open these doors for us. So I've been able to facilitate, me and Rebecca tag team it, generate discussions. Rebecca has finally been able to plug into some of the ladies at the First Baptist Church. She's able, they have a feeding, there's a lot of homeless people out there. So there's a feeding ministry, the church opens their doors at 5.30 at night, every Wednesday, and they just feed whoever comes in. A lot of Native Americans out there, and it was funny because out there, they're like, hey, we, when you look for a place to go, don't go to North and Lacrosse Street, because there's a lot of Natives. I was like, Natives? I was like, We're all American, what are you talking about, Natives? But I guess it means Native American. And also, if you're curious, if you find three Indians, uh, Native Americans together, that's considered a war party. And you can actually fire upon them. I learned that while I was out there. But uh, it, it was also interesting to find out that until like the 70s, it was actually legal to shoot and kill a Mormon until the 70s in Missouri. But obviously that was against you know, federal law and everything else. But it's just funny how some laws stay on the books unknown for so many years. But we've learned a lot. So we're able to facilitate. Rebecca's plugged in with this feeding ministry. She's Anybody play Bunko? Bunko, okay, a couple. So she's figured out Bunko, and she's plugged into a lot of ladies there. And, and, and we're starting to grow. We're starting to make connections and friendships. And in the beginning, when I was trying to find all these people, all, all my open-door folks, now I'm starting to sort of see. I did find Brock. I did find you. I found a few other people in this church as well, just through personalities. I found Rick, too. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so it's like once God broke us, said, take your eyes off them. If all you had was me, would you be content? Would I be your only portion? Would I be your only refuge? Looking back, I'd probably say, at that time, no, I needed contentment with people. But God brought me to my knees, 
allowed me to watch my wife cry on a regular basis to bring us back to him. So I look back, I'm like, God wants to work in us so that he can work through us. You see, there's a poem that I've heard before, you've seen before all the time. I never really thought much about it till this situation. One night I dreamed a dream. As I was walking along the beach with my Lord across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonging to me and one belonging to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand, and I noticed many times along the path, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This troubled me. So I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said you, you once said, I can't even speak. You said, once I decided to follow you, you would walk with me all the way. But I noticed during the saddest, most troublesome times of my life, there's one set of footprints. I don't understand. When I needed you the most, you would leave me. Satan wanted us to stay there. It doesn't end there. He whispered. A still small voice, my precious child, I love you, will never leave you. Never ever during your trials and testings, when you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. And it took a lot for me to realize that. I encourage you, if you go through your bouts of loneliness, if Satan wants to knock you down, keep you down, and keep you down, I encourage you, remember, God promised He will never leave and forsake us. We may take off our spiritual glasses and refuse to see Him, but He's there the entire time. And looking back and reflecting on our situation, God never left us. He was trying to fix us to have contentment with Him. Timothy Keller says, Christ literally walked in our shoes and entered in our affliction. He knows everything that we went through. He's done it. We were never alone. We felt alone. We took our eyes off of his faithfulness. and We took our eyes off the promise of him never forsaking us. He was always there just watching us trying to navigate this life. God, I believe that God put us through the things that we went through for His glory to refocus us and for future purposes. I don't know what that future purpose is. But praise God, I'm glad to report that we're doing well after a long time. God seems to be using both of us, even Alyssa. Alyssa led one of her friends to the Lord. A while back. And so, when I was asked to come out here, I was like, oh man, it would be neat if I could preach. And the pastor had no problem with that. And like I said, I, I wanted to preach on apologetics. The pastor wanted me to give an update. I was set on preaching apologetics. I got my apologetics message all ready to go and everything. But I just couldn't leave alone. Psalm 142. David. He was the promised king. He was anointed. He defeated Goliath. He killed tens of thousands. Yet God allowed him to be chased out and hiding in a cave. Why? When you go through those periods of loneliness, like what we've done, please, even if you do take your eyes off of God, He will never take His eyes off of you. In that, sometimes we do have to reshift our focus and realize like Josiah said, our contentment has to be learned. And it only is going to be learned through those times of desperate need. And so it's always a privilege and an honor to fill these shoes up in the pulpit.
I don't take it lightly. I thank you for allowing me not only to just give an update, but to tie it into Psalm 142. So I encourage you, never forget Jesus loves you, he died for you, and he will always be with you, carrying you, and you only see that one set of footprints. God, I just thank you just for the opportunity again, just to be able to articulate what we've been going through. And Lord, like I said, we finally realized that you won't use a man greatly until you break him greatly. And Lord, we've been broken. But I thank you, God, that you have that amazing super glue to put us all back together and clean up the blemishes. Though we still may have some visible cracks, they are remembrances of what we went through. As the song says, you take away the pain, you leave the scars. And those scars are there for us to remember what we've been through in your faithfulness. God, I thank you that you never left us and you loved us and you have a way for us. God, I thank you that you reshifted our focus. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody out here that needs to reshift their focus, if they feel like they're living on an island, allow them to just fall to their knees and find their solstice, and their focus, and their contentment and portion in Jesus. God, I thank you for this opportunity. Pray you take this uh, invitation. Use it for your honor and your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.